morning and uh, thanks for having me on the program. <coughs> I work for Deloitte, which is a global consulting firm. We have about 12,500 people working globally in healthcare and life sciences. And I've got the privilege of sharing with you some uh, thoughts that I can't take credit for, but uh, that some of our brainiacs have come up with around the future of health. The first point to make is, is um, what's actually going on with regard to innovation. And um, we've been involved quite heavily with the XPRIZE Foundation, so that's given us a front seat at uh, the uh, how to make innovation happen, but also what's coming through the innovation pipeline. And if you look at the uh, chart, it's clearly an exponential picture. And that makes it very difficult to predict how innovation is going to impact your world. If you look at uh, Facebook, for example, it was only launched in 2004. And since then, we've had two innovation cycles, so roughly two lots of seven years. We have 2.3 billion people on the planet using Facebook, so roughly 30% of the world's population is on Facebook and obviously clearly impacted by social media. There's no way you could have predicted that with the normal sort of linear approach to predicting the future. So the first thing about predicting the future is it's really difficult and it's definitely exponential and disruptive. I think the other thing to consider is the uh, speed of innovation. Uh, it obviously runs at a much faster pace than healthcare is comfortable with. So these massive disruptions to the health system can be quite challenging. Uh, we've had Australia recently announce an $80 million grant to actually set up a CAR T cell therapy uh, treatment uh, center in their jurisdiction. It was only approved by the FDA in 2017, so it shows you that even in healthcare we can move very rapidly to adopt technologies. The other big pivot that everybody talks about is moving towards holistic healthcare. So if you define health as an overall state of well-being and uh, spiritual wellness, then the picture really changes because what we're currently geared up to deliver isn't quite uh, set up for that purpose. If you uh, look at the right-hand side of the diagram, a lot of what we do today is assess, treat, repeat. Assess, treat, repeat, and we spin through these loops. We've created these little uh, bastions of power, so you've got hospitals over here and primary care over there and NGOs over there delivering their respective treatment and assessment programs, but it doesn't quite come together and uh, give a holistic experience for the patient. The other challenge that we have is that the bulk of our burden is actually non-communicable diseases. They don't respond very well at all to this sort of model. And nowhere is this more apparent so, in the, so than, um, for example, in mental health. Our su youth suicide rates are appalling. And I think, from memory, around 44% of people who have chosen to take their own lives had some sort of interaction with the health system before doing so. So that tells you that assess, treat, repeat just doesn't work. So for these um, lifestyle, chronic condition, asthma, diabetes type things, we have to actually pivot to the left-hand side of the equation. And that means real interventions during the daily lives and allowing people to live the best possible lives that they can lead with nudging and support out in the community and really influencing the social determinants of their health. So if you buy into this model, it's about real proactive uh, intervention and coaching people to lead better lives. Uh, a bunch of things have to be true. For one, you know, we have to share our data. And you will attest to how difficult that is, and you've had those experiences as well. Data sharing uh, is quite often one of the first barriers that's thrown up. But if you sort of look at the technology, the technology is not actually the excuse. I mean, Apple is able to link to 500 different hospitals already. You can have your own personal health record with Apple. If you're a North American tourist and you happen to interact with our health system here in New Zealand, you'd be expecting your ED details, your chest PA x-rays and everything else to be uploaded to that record. Obviously, we would struggle doing that. As an empowered consumer, you would also expect to have the rights and the control points over your data. Uh, we're seeing a lot of students in the Netherlands at the moment actually monetizing their data. So they're very happy to wear the Fitbit, the Garmin, or the iWatch, and essentially uh, trade all of the data points of their daily lives, or even the medical um, interventions that they have, for free cups of coffee or free meals at the cafeteria. 
we sometimes inadvertently trade our data when we download yet another application from the internet and maybe don't realize that that health or wellness app is sharing data with a third party who in turn is uh, monetizing that through a consortium or something like that. So uh, we do want to nudge people and we do want to influence their behaviors and most of us will have friends who have a Fitbit or a watch or maybe wearing a ring or something and can tell stories about somebody who's slept better, maybe watch their diet, maybe watch their exercise a bit more, maybe reduce their drug and alcohol consumption. So what does technology need to do to allow us to do that? And this is a model that we use to then help organizations figure out what some of these strategic choices are around their future in the healthcare system. So if you wind the clock forward, the real disruption in healthcare is highly likely to come outside the public health system as opposed to coming from <coughs> within it. And you recognize a couple of those stereotypes, or if you will, the, role, the roles on the left-hand side. You've got the classic data platform providers, the Azures, the Amazons, um, the Apples, the Google Analytics platforms of the world. And then in the middle, this is actually where the really interesting stuff is happening. In the US, we've seen Aetna acquire CVS. Um, so Aetna is a large health insurance plan and uh, provides a comprehensive set of benefits to all of their um, health uh, members with you know, millions and millions of members. And CVS has 10,000 odd stores across the United States. CVS is now branded as a health business, so they've taken tobacco off the shelves. Now they can link your health plan data with your behaviors and moments in the store. They can offer you the one-minute nurse check-in. They can offer you a medication review with the pharmacist in store and suddenly really help you make day-to-day -day choices. They know not to promote the peanuts to you because you have hypertensions, and they know not to promote the chocolate bars to you if you happen to be diabetic. So that really changes the game around the experience that you can ultimately create for somebody. And on the far right-hand side, so the green boxes, if you will, on the diagram, this is where our supply chains will see quite a bit of disruption because everybody is geared up towards getting things in and out of a hospital or in and out of a local GP or community practice, and we're very location-bound. But in the future of health, if you're really wanting to deliver the next best nudge or the next best action to a consumer, you have to be present in their lives and where they choose to be. And that means your supply chain has to change. I think the last point to touch on is the finances. Um, everybody knows the problem of the wrong wallet. So I do the right things over here, but the benefits land over there. So the way insurers and governments adjust to how we monetize, commercialize, and incentivize the right behaviors is also going to be really important. So I hope that's given you a glimpse of some of the disruptions that we might be um, uh, facing in the future. And thanks for listening in. I think that was a really wonderful overview. I'm not even sure where to go in there because there's just so much packed into there. Um, I think I'm going to focus on the more preventative side because it's not really something that's kind of rolled out in that system or in our current system, as, you, as you've mentioned. Um, what are some of the practical things that we can be doing in the preventative care space um, in New Zealand? So um, the preventative care is really driven by the day-to-day -day choices that you make. And uh, Kaiser in the US is a good example of... Uh, my, my apologies. Back to the microphone. Uh, preventative care is a, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a great sort of example. And I think if you look at Kaiser, for example, in the US, if I'm a Kaiser member, they will prompt me if I haven't had my medication review or my regular hemoglobin A1C check and a bunch of other things. And they will actually notify me on my iPhone if I'm walking by a pharmacy or a local retail clinic that's happy to do that. If I step into that clinic, um, you know, just to do my one-off annual check, they will also at the same time say, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I can't role play this one, but if, for example, I was overdue for a breast scan or mm -hmm. something like that, they'll encourage me to maybe have that done. So they will serve up all the right actions for me at that point in time in my life. And they do that by just knowing me, knowing what it is I need, and what is the next best action for me in my daily routine at that particular point in time. So that's very tangible and it is very real. Um, 
And I think, you know, the simple stuff like the wearables, you commented earlier about the tsunami of data. <laughs> you know, people used to worry about somebody walking into the GP and saying, I've read this thing on Google and I think I have the XYZ disease. Now they walk in and say, I had a bit of chest pain yesterday and the last time I played footy and here's my Fitbit and here's my Garmin. You know, can you look at my last 72 hours worth of data and help me figure out whether I should be worried? We're just not equipped for that, but the consumers are. It makes for an interesting model of like, what does the future of like a doctor's office or a G GP clinic look like? Like, will you maybe have a data scientist just sitting there, maybe, potentially something in there, someone looking at your data?